Matt, this is a very important film to you. Yeah. Bushwhack is hilarious to me because of how much it meant to you. <laughs> it's my precious. This was originally conceived as a Home Alone spin-off. I think that's an urban legend. Really? Uh -huh. Welcome to Movie Nights again, everyone! It's an important day. We're all gathered here to commemorate the 28th anniversary of Bushwhacked Fever. <laughs> <laughs> we sure are. Bushwhacked Fever! It's August 4th, and let me tell you, August 4th, 1995, was an important day for the history of cinema. It sure. was an important day for you, wasn't it? Were you there, uh, like, the opening day to see Bushwhacked? <laughs> I was not there opening day in 1995 in a US <laughs> cinema. <laughs> Probably two years later in a video store somewhere. <laughs> yeah, did you even get it in the UK, or they're like, get that out of here! <laughs> no, we did not get this in cinemas in the UK. It did so badly, they didn't release it in cinemas, just went straight to video. You were spared the bushwhack fever. Like, so many bushwhack died. Bushwhack fever got snuffed out here. They got the vaccine. Bushwhack fever went away. It never made its way across the pond. That's good. Yeah. Matt, this is a very important film to you, I know. Um, so you're, as the, the bushwhacked expert, can you give the audience maybe like a, a paragraph summary of what bushwhacked is? Oh, okay. Apparently I'm the bushwhacked expert being the Daniel Stern of film critics. <laughs> bushwhacked is about a delivery driver played by Daniel Stern called Mad Max Grabelski, who finds himself being framed for a murder and money laundering scheme and via a series of incredible incredibly elaborate coincidences, somehow finds himself confused with being the scout leader for a troop, and then decides to lead them into the mountains to try and get to the final package of the guy that framed him to try and exonerate himself. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bunch of whole... issues with this plot through the whole thing. Like, why are they yeah. doing that? How does that make sense? This is our <laughs> second or third time watching Bushwhacked. I, lo I lost track, but uh, this whole time we were watching it, we're like, wait, what is the plan now? Why did they frame him for murder before the last package comes? Yeah. And then that Get guy... Get the dead guy to sign for yeah, it. The, the guy who's supposedly <laughs> dead signs for the package yeah, that's yeah. being sent to him. Yeah. I was thinking about this when I was watching it. I was thinking, going like, this doesn't make any sense. The scheme of the bad guy has so <laughs> many holes in it. Fundamentally, the movie doesn't actually tell you why he's even doing it in the first place, which is always a great thing no. I find he's, in a movie. Well, he's, he's stealing the money. Money, right? He's, he's stealing. Yeah. The point is to get rich. That's... Corrupt FBI guy, but they don't really tell you why Daniel Stern's in this mess till he kind of explains the story to the kids. Right, yeah, they don't really explain it very well. Do you take the deal? It sounds like a setup. Only a sucker would fall for that. Before we get to this, though, I do want you to explain to the audience <laughs> why Bushwhacked is an important <laughs> film to you, because that's a big thread to leave hanging yeah. for people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bushwhacked, I guess, is important to me because when I was about six or seven years old and I was getting into film, I rented out Bushwhacked from my local video store because I was huge into Home Alone. So I saw Daniel Stern the cover and went, Oh, that's a movie I want to see with a bunch of screaming children are oh, even better. So I became obsessed <laughs> with Bushwhacked at a very young age. I feel like everyone has one from when they were a kid, right? Where they're like, why? The cringe <laughs> of remembering past you obsessed with that. And I think Bushwhacked is that for you. <laughs> they often have Daniel Stern in them for some reason. Who knew? Director of Rookie of the Year? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I was so obsessed with Bushwhacked. I remember recording it off of television. Do you remember those Tyco videos? cameras that would plug into the VCR and record in black and white. I recorded an intro to the movie on my Tyco video cam. I wish I still had this tape because I'd be cutting in this footage right now. If you still had it, I'd be like, it'd be irresponsible not yeah. to put that into, the, into this video. Matt, do you remember what you did? Yeah, you like, do like, like you a, say. A dramatic reenactment <laughs> like, of this intro? Here comes a classic by Daniel Stern. <laughs> Violin music in the background. Yeah. yeah, I think it was pretty much that tone failure. It was pretty much like, I think this is a really underrated movie. Do you remember when they showed Home Alone 2 on television and they cut some of the brick scene? Wonderful forensic insights about movie making. And thus I prepared myself for an entire career of sitting in front of a camera talking about movies at the age of seven or eight. That's a real video cam. We're making real videos. This is your Joker origin yeah. story. <laughs> it all started with 
<laughs> yeah, it all started here. The embryonic film brain came to the day that Bushwhacked was shown on Channel 5. <laughs> this is the only reason we're doing Bushwhack. Bushwhack yeah. is hilarious to me because of how much it meant to you. It's like become like a joke among us. Bushwhacked fever. Amazing. Bushwhack fever! We would chat about movies quite a lot, and I would keep bringing up Bushwhacked. We're like, we gotta see Bushwhacked. Yeah. <laughs> I was selling it to you, and then you watched it and you went, this is not very good. <laughs> what is that? My mom kind of wrote the words. Well, they suck! It was not good, but we had a lot of laughs imagining you laughing at it. Yeah. And we would imagine that commercial for Bushwhacked telling everyone they have Bushwhacked yeah. fever. Get whacked. Bushwhacked. And every time something not funny would happen, we would just go, Bushwhacked. Yeah. <laughs> Bushwhacked. You guys need a good whack. I liked imagining it this time, though, with the working title, Tenderfoot. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it was called the Tenderfoot, and you can tell because there are several moments where they just drop Tenderfoot into the dialogue. Yeah. yeah. You kids went right past Tenderfoot badges. What are you guys, a bunch of Tenderfoots? Tenderfoot. Which is a, a, a weird word. I guess the Tenderfoot is kind of the name of, they're not Boy Scouts, but they're a Boy Scout equivalent in the they don't division know what their or whatever. Name is. Tenderfoots. <laughs> Yeah, I think on the flag in the background it says uh, America, America Scouts. Scouts. And they must have had to change it for some yeah, reason. Yeah, then they're like the Ranger Scouts or something. <laughs> Ranger Scouts? Yes. I'll take six ranger scouts over one federal man any day. So I think what happened was they wanted to get the Boy Scouts for yeah, the movie, yeah. obviously, and the Boy Scouts rejected them, probably on the basis of one, it doesn't make them look very good, and two, <laughs> this scout group has a girl in it, which technically they weren't actually having in Boy Scouts until 2018. So on that level, Bushwhacked is remarkably progressive. <laughs> There's no point, just, just like anything in this movie. There's no point, there's no payoff. They're just like, a girl's in the group? Go, 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 go! Ranger Scouts are for guys. Guys in aprons. Tenderfoot. And then the yeah. end, the oh, end well. of the story. Yeah. They just need her to have a bra in one scene to like make yeah. a slingshot out of. Hey, That's girls are it. okay. They come with slingshots. <laughs> <laughs> Training bra's working great. This is almost like in a second base. IMDb trivia mentioned the Boy Scout thing. Mm. And it was like kind of irrelevant because it isn't the Boy Scouts. The fact that the Boy Scouts rejected them is relevant. But the whole thing about the girls, it's like, well, it's not the Boy Scouts. Yeah. So it's not really a goof. They're a different group. They're the Ranger Scouts. <laughs> It's just different. It's legally distinct from the Boy Scouts. Ah! Oh no, I must have joined the Ranger Scouts. It's funny that you mentioned that you watched this and loved it because of Home Alone. Because mm. supposedly, I, I don't know if this is confirmed or just a rumor, this uh. was originally conceived as a Home Alone spinoff. I'm going to put some cold water on that. I think that's an urban legend. Really? Uh. I think that someone added that to IMDb absolutely way back when, and it's become kind of like gospel. Because of course, Daniel Stern is literally channeling Marv throughout the entire oh, movie. Yeah, yeah. It's literally the unofficial Marv film. Hello? Anybody home? I can actually tell you the actual genesis of the movie, which is just as interesting. Daniel Stern directed Rookie of the Year. And that was a success. Yeah, that was a bit of a hit. Yeah. So 20th Century Fox offered him like a multi-picture deal. We got some projects for you. Here's Tenderfoot. <laughs> eh, I'm not feeling this, but I might develop it. And that Tenderfoot script was written by Bobby and Peter Farrelly, pre-Dumb and Dumber. Mm. Wow. No way. This is the uncredited Farrelly Brothers movie. I believe that IMDb has <laughs> partially updated this in that one of the pseudonyms for them now has Bobby Farrelly listed, but weirdly Peter Farrelly isn't listed for this movie. So there's a story credit for John Jordan and Danny Byers and two of the four screenwriting credits. Those are pseudonyms for the Farrelly Brothers. What wasted comedy talent in this film? There's so many people who have been in yeah. better things or involved with better things and then you have this. Daniel Stern was an executive producer on this, so he helped write it, or what did he, he just helped produce it? He was really involved in it, as I understand it. Obviously, it was meant as like a star vehicle for him, so he kind of right. sh helped shepherd the entire thing. He got his friends to rewrite the script for him. To what? <laughs> what are you working on? It's a crystal diode receiver. And that is a beauty. That's the toolbox. 
Well, uh, Tenderfoot. He was offered to direct it after Rookie of the Year, and he went, well, it's a movie set in the mountains. It's got loads of action scenes. If I'm starring in it, I probably shouldn't be directing it at the same time. I guess he sort of ghost directed it, because the actual creator director, Greg Beeman, I remember reading a Daniel Stern AMA on Reddit, and he said, oh, I pretty much did the entire post-production for the movie, because the actual director went off and did some other project. Which makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because it does feel like Daniel Stern was in charge of the edit. It feels like the edit was trying to save it. Maybe that was what was going on because there are some scenes, there's clearly no payoff to it. Like, That's the problem with a lot of the jokes. It's like, it's a bunch of build up and you're waiting for like the big punchline and then yeah. it just kind of like, eh, fizzles and out. It Move on. <laughs> but sometimes they'll add like some wacky music like maybe this is inspiring? Yeah. Getting good old Max to where he needs to go. Who's Max? Max is all of us. We are gonna push ourselves to the map. What I noticed on this viewing was just how much ADR there is in this movie. There is so much yeah. added in jokes from off camera. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't look down. Too late. The classic entirely invented conversations. The camera cuts away from the people actually speaking in a conversation. <laughs> sure you want to do this? We didn't come this far to quit now. It feels like it starts and ends in the middle. It doesn't really feel like there's a setup at the beginning. It just sort of jumps in and then you're like, how far are we into this movie? It feels like this should be way farther into it. And then kind of nothing happens but mugging in the woods for 90 minutes <laughs> yeah. until finally like an ending. I always have a suspicion that there was way more material at the beginning of this movie because literally yeah. five minutes in, Daniel Stern gets framed. We barely have an idea of what's even going on at the start of the movie. He walks in and then Stan Alive starts playing for some reason. And it's like, is this supposed to be funny? Is this establishing the character? Yeah. Wow. And he goes Look at him the... order a Coke and cigarettes and like that's an order would make the clerk care. It's not even that like, weird of an yeah. order. Two packs of Marlboros, some snowballs, and a jumbo Coke. <laughs> It's not healthy, but it's not that weird. The yeah. guy's like, oh, <gasps> Coke and cigarettes, you can't have that. It's funny because in a weird coincidence, another movie that released on August 4th, 1995 was the movie Virtuosity. And there's a scene where Russell Crowe's Sid 6.0 seven or whatever the hell it is in that movie. He's walking down, strutting to staying alive. Two movies <laughs> literally had staying I've alive. I've seen sequences. Virtuosity. I don't remember this. Why did that happen? <laughs> that was about like a serial killer made out of other serial killers. What the fuck happened there? <laughs> he had to stay alive from the serial killer. <laughs> The serial killer, Daniel Stern. <laughs> Man, Max Grabelski. I'm dead, mister. We got Mad the bushwhacked Mad. virus. No, the bushwhacked fever <laughs> got into the computer. Damn it. Look, that's an insane movie. I don't remember why Staying Alive happens, but it probably made more sense than bushwhacked. It's just there as a reference, basically. Hey, Tony. Two or three. Two, give me two. Let's go. He goes in, he's mugging from the start. They set up the plot, but very briefly. They don't really, because we had to go back several times and try and piece together from other parts of the movie what was happening. Yeah. But apparently, he was late for work, and his boss is mad that he's late for work. He's a package delivery guy. And he's like, our guarantee is 10 a.m. every day. Get out there. And he's like, all right. So he gets out there. And he's meant it cuts to, to night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, he also establishes the guy who wants the package asked for him specifically. Right. Yes. So he goes out there, but it's 10 at night because he was planning on delivering this late anyway because later in the movie, yeah, halfway way to like <laughs> near the end, he establishes that he has been asked by the guy he's delivering this to to deliver six packages at 10 p.m. to his house. He will pay him 50 bucks a package. Yes. 10 o'clock sharp, just like you said. Give me that $50 tip. So he shows up at this house and discovers a fire there, supposedly with the guy inside, which we later find out he's alive because he's signing for packages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the FBI guys bust in and he nonsensically grabs the gun because it gets knocked out of the guy's hands. They're like, don't do anything stupid. Try and stop me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't do anything stupid. Try and stop me. That should have been the tagline, right, for the movie. <laughs> Feeling stupid? I know I am. Feeling stupid? I know I am. I don't know why he does this because at this point he's not under threat. He has the gun. There's no reason for him to run away at this or point. Or jump out the window. Or jump out the window. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, he's circumstantially tied to a murder, basically. But there's no way that they could actually prosecute him, aside from him just being there. Why did they do this, though? Why do they need him to come at 10 p.m. to deliver these packages right. and to be set up for this murder? And not even all of the packages, because one more is going not to his house, but to the mountains. And, like, and if they didn't do the cabin delivery, Mad Max Grabowski would have had no way to track where they were yeah. going near the end of the movie, so and the movie this. wouldn't have happened. No. It says this package is going someplace in the mountains. Who the hell goes to the mountains? Why <laughs> would they have that one last package? Because then they would have to account for that, and they would be like, well, it can't be that guy, because he's on the run or in jail if their plan had gone like they wanted yeah. it to. What was the point of delivering them at night other than to raise suspicion? <laughs> like <laughs> He has the delivery truck, too. They kidnap a couple people and don't kill them yeah. also. There's a lot of loose ends. Yeah. We're the corrupt <laughs> FBI guy. He gets the scout leader and then ties him to a tree. It's like, he has to be dead. Otherwise, he can point you out as corrupt. It's so astronomically baffling. Like, there are so <laughs> many holes with the villain's scheme. It's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. And it starts with the fact that we don't even know why he's doing it in the first place. <laughs> if it's just for money laundering, why does he fake his own death by extremely elaborate circumstances? Like, somehow they have a body in that room that we never see, but they mentioned right. there's been there. Yeah, whose body? But has his teeth because they've been surgically extracted one by one <laughs> in a weird, bizarre plot point that is barely in the movie. We had to identify him using only his teeth. It was gross, I'm telling you. It was sorry, really, sorry, really enough, gross. They have a great payoff at the end, though, when Daniel Stern tackles him and he punches his teeth out. It's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> They're setting him up for the fall so they can steal the money and no one's looking for them. They already think they have the guy and he's yeah. dead, so they're not going to be looking into who it is. But the method they go about this doesn't make any sense. That's yeah. the part where they lost me. The movie does such a bad job of establishing this that the main antagonist of the film and the instigating event of Daniel Stern being hired happens completely off screen and isn't even properly clarified until 45 minutes into the running time. Yeah. Like, no. The main villain of the movie doesn't even show up until an hour in. The only time we see him beforehand is on mugshot photos and a big painting of him. And then he comes in a helicopter and we're supposed to recognize who the hell he is. Two FBI guys. Two coming. FBI guys. Right Was in. the second one corrupt, Matt? Do you know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I kept wondering, like, is he actually in on it like the John Polito one? We should, yeah. we should mention the FBI guy is played by Coen Brothers regular John Polito. Another example of a very yeah. old for qualified cast. The other FBI guy is played by Tom Wood, who I guess is meant to be a reference to The Fugitive because he was one of Tommy Lee Jones's guys in that movie. Oh, okay. I was wondering, I was like, are they doing The Fugitive at parts of this? Because it felt like yeah, they were doing Yeah, because the scout fugitive. guy kind of channels that. I bit. felt like, yeah, a little bit of Tommy Lee Jones there. The scout guy channels that, and then there is literally the moment where John Polito goes, we got a fugitive on the loose! We got a fugitive on the loose here, people! <laughs> yeah. We get what movies should do, and you're doing a kiddie cliffhanger and the fugitive simultaneously. But if they were actually doing that, then it would be a better movie, because it feels yeah. like they're not even doing that no, at no. all. Like, not well. But, like, I vaguely remember these things existed around the time. <laughs> One of the commercials for this is a parody of Cliffhanger, but that's more than you really see in this movie. The other one is just meant to be completely incompetent. Okay. Right, because he bumbles into him. It I mean, super what seemed he like he was in on it, though. <laughs> Yeah. Like where he pushes back against the mother trying to search for them and it's like, okay, so he's definitely in on it and then just nothing happens with him. <laughs> no resolution at the end of the movie. He just disappears. <laughs> he yeah. just disappears. Uh, what is the sequence of events according to him? Daniel Stern shows up at this house. There is a fire. He thinks that he's just there for a delivery. The FBI is already there. Yeah. What is the FBI there to investigate? If the corrupt guy was there, maybe he was like, yeah. all right, we're going to catch him. The corrupt guy would make him, sense course, if the other guy's the there. Yeah. would have to be in on it unless yeah. he was just a big old doofus and maybe that was the idea but the movie needs to clarify this because it seems like this is a horrible yeah. miscarriage of justice i'm just saying it's just very wishy-washy i guess he went along with it because that's his superior it's like oh yeah his superior knows about it even though he's corrupt i'm too stupid to notice you need to this establish things, right. movie. they have copious 
endless amounts of time where nothing is happening and they could have established <laughs> things, but they don't. They instead dedicate it to mugging in the woods and they have a scene. Man, okay, so we should also establish Daniel Stern, while he's on the run, he goes to a gas station and he ends up encountering a Boy Scout leader who is kind of like a, a, a hard ass. Yes. And he's mad that he parked in a handicapped spot and so they get into a tussle together and he ends up switching vehicles with him in order to get out of being caught because he's wanted now. What and did Daniel Stern do with the shopkeeper, by the way? Yeah, did he murder him? <laughs> <laughs> Tenderfoot. Again, another very jumpy sequence to the point where they pull in to that little shop and then when he's holding the other guy hostage, the cars miraculously turn direction so that they can drive out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they end up switching vehicles and Daniel Stern like glues him to his, uh, <laughs> his steering wheel. This mix up with the cars ends up having him take his place with yes. the Boy Scout equivalents. It's through another coincidence because he's driving driving up to go to Devil's Peak where the other delivery is. I don't know what he's going to do when he arrives there because he'll be three days early for that delivery. But anyway, he's, <laughs> he's trying to drive up and he gets caught in traffic and meanwhile the scout group who are waiting for their leader to arrive have apparently called the state patrol who finds the truck, finds the guy and leads him directly yeah. to the scout group. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? This is so contrived. At half the movie you're spending just going like, how did this happen? What are they doing this for? Who's this now? <laughs> yeah, you still don't know why the main plot is happening. Why is this money being delivered to this guy's house in the first place by a FedEx equivalent to be destroyed? Why would that oh, yeah, be the yeah. procedure? It was his job to destroy, uh, well, at least according to the FBI guy, maybe yeah. that was a cover up, but he said it well, was he his says job it on to the destroy news. old money. Yeah. If he's lying on TV, someone should notice. <laughs> it feels like there's a kind of interesting movie happening just off camera somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. Even if that was the plan, I feel like there would be a major problem with the fact that a nationwide manhunt, or at least statewide manhunt, is happening, like, very publicly on television. This guy has been murdered by this guy, and then, like, a couple of days later, he just accepts a parcel at his house in his own name after he states his own death. Like, that yeah. last package delivery yeah. was placed under his own name or under his own company's name. If there's another package for Timberline Inc., or Reinhardt bragged it. You're in luck. I found it. It's supposed to be delivered on Monday. And that he was signs their, for He that. signs for he it. Signs and this for was it. their plan. I will be dead at this point and then get another delivery. Um. <laughs> You could have had someone else there, like his, I don't know, maid or something, or the FBI guy pretending to be, like, all signed for him because he's deceased. Yeah, the FBI he's guy like, is there at the end of the movie. Like, he should be the one that takes right. the package if this is the, if, like, he's faking his own death. I mean, none of it really makes sense. Why'd you pick me? Because you're a pathetic loser, Max. Ah! Daniel Stern takes the place of this Boy Scout leader and then takes all of the kids out on this overnight trip. And that's when they discover that he's the guy right. that's wanted. Well, I think so we've, think we've that, skipped forward a couple murderer. of steps here. We need to linger on the fact that he arrives at this Boy Scout group. <laughs> he literally oh, yeah. shows up in a leather coat with Italian loafers, clearly not climbing material in any way whatsoever. Demonstrably has no knowledge of what he's doing. Not no. even convincingly like, for a half a second. Overnight. Right. Yeah. And this mother's supposed to be like running this scout group right. but she's never talked to this guy apparently and she's like oh well this weirdo showed up who's not ready for any of this i'll leave all the kids with him bye have fun with them in the woods do whatever you want she ordered it through scouts leaders are us over the phone apparently <laughs> can i rent a scout leader. <laughs> this never required actually speaking to him in person for the stupid plot to happen. Yeah. How, how did the, the cop that pulled over Daniel Stern not recognize a guy from this national manhunt? Who it's knows? like everywhere. Like the store keep recognized no. him, but not the cop who should be aware of well, someone on the run. All the authorities like are him. so inept in this. <laughs> Once they realize who Daniel Stern really is with the kids up in the woods, they're like, all right, we'll send one 
FBI guy, maybe the corrupt one, why not him, and the scout leader guy. Not the That's whole SWAT it. team. They have a SWAT team to do what? Jack Diddley? Like, yeah, the they'll hang there's out. There's a SWAT team down there and they just do nothing. He would have this whole group searching the woods, but it's like, no, just these two guys. I think we're good with two guys. <laughs> They're playing camp at the bottom of the mountain with the parents. They're keeping them occupied. Well, that's what you get SWAT in to do, right? Yeah. All yeah. the parents, including the two parents that have anything to do, the one that runs the scouts and this other guy who's yeah. worried, I guess. I don't know it, why he has any screen time. It's, it's funny because no he's worried. <laughs> I don't know if they're trying to make it heartfelt or what, but it doesn't go anywhere. The mother is actually played by Anne Dowd, who went on to win an Emmy for The Handmaid's Tale. Again, another person that's wildly overqualified for the mum <laughs> in a kid's film. Although technically it's not a kid's film, but it kind of feels mostly yeah. like a kid's film. I mean, who does it appeal to? Young Matthew Buck, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's only for this? you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is a PG movie over here. Here, but when it was first released in America, it was a PG-13 movie. Rated PG-13. Get whacked tomorrow. And I think that was part of the reason why it bombed at the box office. I mean, he does say, like, would you put your wiener in a light socket yeah, and stuff like that. Yeah, he throws that. bitch out at one yeah, point. He throws bitch. Yeah, one of the first things he says to the kids is, I oh, was a real bitch. Yeah. And then, like, they're like, yeah, this seems like the right guy. Yeah, seems yeah. legit. <laughs> seems completely legit. Can you tell us about the time you sold the baguette? Yeah! yeah. Come on, tell us. Everest? It was a bitch! He can barely say any lines without shouting. Like earlier in the movie when he sees the fire, yeah. he's like, what's cooking? Hey, Mr. B, what's cooking? <laughs> Why? <laughs> hey, boss. Hey, boss. <laughs> Mugs his way to the window. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he very nearly says the F word at one point because the, the, when they're peeing over the cliff, he goes, oh, oh fudge. Yeah, I mean, I, maybe the fact that all of the kids piss on a guy made it a piece of <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I love when they're peeing on him. He goes like, oh, a nice cool stream. <laughs> A little spritz of cool, clean mountain rain. Why is the urine cool? Are the kids dead? <laughs> it's such a stupid setup. Just for a really gross out gag of the fact that he's being pissed on by a bunch of children. Standard family film fare, apparently. <laughs> I got some bad news for you, Palmer. That ain't rain. Piss whack. It's not rain! It's not oregano! <laughs> What'd you put in the pizza today? Always the same, the best. That's not oregano. <laughs> He takes him out to the woods. A lot of nothing proceeds to happen. There's yeah. not a lot of payoff to things. I think my favorite non-gag is <laughs> when they encounter a bear. And there's a long setup for this. This scene goes on uh, for about two years. <laughs> <laughs> so the mama bear comes out and is mad at Daniel Stern. He ends up fainting from fear. And the kids think that he is demonstrating playing dead for them to get away from the bear. And then he proceeds to turn into an obvious dummy as this bear thrashes him around, but kind of gently. It's yeah. kind of a gentle thrashing. Like, if you're gonna turn someone into an obvious dummy, you need to have that bear fucking tossing yeah, him like into a tree. Throw him down the cliff Throw him or down the cliff. Come on, like, go crazy with it. Oh, no, obvious dummies are hilarious in any circumstance. But it's like, no. they barely do anything. You just see the stiff dummy kind of like, eh, yeah. <laughs> like, fall over next to a tree. And like, you could have done anything with this, and this is how you choose to end the scene, like, doing nothing, basically. It should have been like that Walker, Texas Ranger episode where Walker ends up playing with a baby bear exactly like Daniel Stern does and then gets mauled to fucking oblivion by the bear and then later has to fight a cannibal man in the woods and the bear saves his life. That's That should have been bushwhacked. That episode of Walker, Texas Ranger had more happen in it than bushwhacked because so much of this is just yeah. wandering and maybe they'll play some wacky music. There's several scenes that just sort of fade out because they have no ending to it. So just like... That a man of your achievement has taken the time for the youth of America. <laughs> Tenderfoot. I wish they did like run into a cannibal or something because this needed some higher points of like what is going on because like once they get to the woods it's so just meandering. Ooh, yeah. Oh wasp nest. I think that's a pine cone so I'll play with it because I'm too dumb to live. Oh no it's wasp. Ah! Next scene. Daniel Sturd's character is so stupid that it defies logic completely. It's not just that he doesn't know about the woods it's that he does things that no human being would ever do. Like, drink bug him, spray. Yeah, bug spray. He has to take the top off 
stuff with the spray thing to yeah. drink it orally because he thinks that's how you take bug spray. And then they're like, how do we make this funny because it's not funny? Just ADR him going, that's tangy. <laughs> That's a little tangy. This might be a contender for one of the stupidest movies ever made, and yet somehow I still adore this. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go. I feel like I kind of enjoyed it more this time around. It's still not good. I mean, there's some good stunt work in the movie at points. They clearly committed to doing the stunt work. Most of the comedy in the movie is Daniel Stern running around in the woods, and the single solitary joke is that he doesn't know how to handle himself. So he goes like three meters into the wilderness, and he's like, Oh my god! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Tenderfoot. He wants to try and mug everything's face off. Like, this will get the bear. Oh! The amount that you like bushwhacked depends on your tolerance for Daniel Stern cranking his Marv meter up to 11 and then breaking off the knob. <laughs> yeah, well, he's doing that, but, like, it's not against anything. Yeah. See, what it worked in Home Alone is that he was trying to kill this kid, and then he keeps one-upping the criminals. There's something to play against, and he's also got, like, Well, the and the violence goes so high in Home Alone, yeah. too. <laughs> so it kind of, like, fit that movie, but it doesn't fit that this movie, because nothing's really happening against it, and nothing really no. funny is happening. If they wanted to do Home Alone in the mountains, they could have used the moment when the kids realize they're with this wanted murder instead of having them give him a water jug with some sleeping pills in it, they could have set up some traps. They could have used their skills to like set him up and then chase him through the woods or he's trying to get away and they're like, we're going to get this guy because he killed someone. You know, they could have done something with it. The zaniness need to be up around like Chris Farley levels sometimes. You know, like, <laughs> but they were at Steven Seagal Yeah, level. they were at Steven Seagal levels. Is everything okay? I think Dougie here needs a... Uh... Soda. Sugul whacked. I'm the new bushwhacked. <laughs> I'm the tenderfoot. I'll tenderly kick your ass. I'm going to say, Daniel Stern's a national treasure. We love Daniel Stern. We're not trying to be too mean. These story problems didn't matter one iota to me as a six or seven year old kid because I wanted <laughs> to see Daniel Stern marve it up in this movie. And guess what? He went, I'm marving it up. <laughs> it would be amazing. It's marvin time and then he marved all over the place. <laughs> It'd be amazing though if you found your old intro and you're like, I don't understand how this money laundering plot works, <laughs> but it's Young still Yu funny. Like, <laughs> Young Yu is like, I hate this movie actually. <laughs> Nothing about this plot makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Bad Movie Beatdown. <laughs> and now on Turner Classic Movies, Bushwhacked. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't how we should be celebrating its 28th anniversary. No. We should be talking about all the good moments, you know? Yeah, we should like, be succumbing to the Bushwhack Fever. <laughs> Bushwhack Fever! There was a payoff to the glue thing. They glued the FBI guy to a tree. To Somehow that works. <laughs> the bark wouldn't break yeah. anything. <laughs> Oh, oops. <laughs> I do want to say, to Daniel Stern's credit, the parts of the movie where he was not mugging, there was maybe like a minute of it where he decided <laughs> to pull back a little and like humanize. You, you, you his remember character. Daniel Stern can be good for a yeah, moment. Yeah, you remember that he's actually an incredibly talented actor <laughs> who somehow just went astray in this film. He was just high off of the Home Alone fever into Bushwhack <laughs> fever. He has moments where he's just like, hey, those are my kids. After the kids like come and help him out, you kind of see something there mm. where it's like, okay, you either needed more of this or you needed to go way wackier with the rest of it because so far it's just sort of mediocre really. I kind of feel like Stern's performance is almost like one of two halves because in the first half of the movie he's really really ramped up <laughs> and then in the second half yeah. of the movie he kind of dials it down a little bit and you kind of go like, that probably was the right level and if someone on set actually directed like, okay maybe going a little bit too much it might have salvaged it. I think the tone of the movie is really weird and that that makes sense because it started out as a Farrelly Brothers movie. It kind of feels similar to like Dumb and Dumber. You've got Jeff Daniels and Jim Carrey kind of goofing it, but it's set against this criminal conspiracy from Charles Rocket. It's almost like a parallel <laughs> setup with Bushwhacked and the guy in the cabin, but less successful at that juxtaposition. Yeah, but like Dumb and Dumber, they had people to play off of. They yeah. were too stupid to live and they were going over the top. Everyone reacted to that. It was ridiculous. Daniel Stern doesn't really have 
have a lot of people to react to him, mm. other than the Boy Scouts, but they don't really seem to react that big to it. They don't realize he's being an idiot half the time when he is. Yeah, because they believe he's supposed to be the leader. Mm. And I guess you're supposed to laugh at the fact he's telling them wrong things. <laughs> or maybe they're like, what if we did this and the kids know better? Or Daniel Stern telling them that he wants to kill the kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How come your nickname's Spider? Because they once killed a kid who called me Spider one time too many. I'm gonna kill that kid! I'm gonna murder that kid. <laughs> I like when he makes that one kid face his fear by threatening to kill him on the bridge. <laughs> Inspirational life lessons from this way. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. Spider, I'm afraid too. Shut up, you gutless worm. I'm talking to her. Speaking of life lessons, I will tell you the favorite scene when I was six or seven years old, and it was definitely the birds and the bees scene. <laughs> Though. Why it did that so happen? Nothing. Why did those kids want him to do that? Oh, we really want to hear this book. weird guy tell us it about says in the sex. Book that a strange adult should tell us about sex with dolls. <laughs> the scout leader is supposed to tell us about that kind of stuff. Really? Really? I love that that was the setup. They're like, oh, I guess if you talk about sex with the scout leader, they're obligated to tell you about the birds and the bees. And he's just like, I don't know about this. And then he just gets into it like, eee! <laughs> oh, <laughs> big <laughs> <into> it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how Daddy likes it. Oh, that's good. <laughs> what is wrong with him? <laughs> He tells the kids, though, you, like, turn Leno on after. That's probably the most unfunny thing he ever said. Yeah, that's how you know that he is the most single man who ever lived. <laughs> the man has a cigarette, watches a little Leno, and goes to sleep. Tenderfoot. No return dates after that. They didn't set up a romance with him and the scout mom. You would think in a movie like this they would normally set up a romance, but nope. they don't. What kind of nuts did the kids say these were? <laughs> they didn't have time. <laughs> There are too many jokes to get to. <laughs> so that scene with the birds and the bees, when you were at the stage, you know, the concept of what was going on in that scene, the implication of something being a little bit rude. I'm sure that's part of the reason why I like this movie so much. It's like, hmm, there's a lot of jokes that aren't really for kids in this. Yeah, there is, but it also feels like it doesn't go hard enough. Yeah, it's not really a family movie, but it's not really a movie for adults. It's in a weird middle ground. But I will, I will tell you now that I found that part so <laughs> funny that when I first watched this, movie and I still remember this. I watched the movie back to back twice. I rewound the tape and watched it over again. Yeah, like, the birds and the bee suits coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember laughing so hard I was struggling to breathe. <laughs> oh, man. You had full bushwhack fever. They should have interviewed you for that commercial. We have a genuine reaction to bushwhack that's really this enthusiastic about it. Fly with alcohol and just get drunk and to admit to having bushwhack fever. What if we just surprised him by having Daniel Stern show up like yeah. he made your dreams come true? <laughs> Here to talk about bushwhack! <laughs> it was in his room the whole time. <laughs> you know that Daniel Stern's gonna be watching these videos. <laughs> <laughs> if Daniel Stern watched this, that's not a 0% possibility. Can you make a YouTube video? <laughs> and, and say, say hello to you're Matt. You're dead, mister. Yeah, tell Matt how much it means to you that <laughs> yeah. he has bushwhack fever. You brought back Marv, you can bring back Mad Max. <laughs> and if you can throw in a few little monsters references for Allison's sake, that's all good as well. <laughs> Shit, yeah. why did I forget he was in Little Monster? Can you throw I Little Monsters? I just made a reference. What? Oh, you're dead, Matt. <laughs> So stupid! Not dead, Mr. I'm so stupid! I'm so sorry, Mr. Stern! I love Little Monsters. That was my favorite childhood movie. Both of our childhoods were made by you. <laughs> Little Monsters is better than Bushwhacked. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna debate it. I've never now. seen Little Monsters. I'm sure it is. There's no denying that if you grew up in the 90s, Daniel Stern was a seminal part of your childhood. Both movies had piss jokes in it. <laughs> in Little Monsters, a kid drinks piss. That's probably grosser. Yeah. <laughs> Who put piss in my apple juice? 
piss whacked. Who's bigger in performance, Howie Mandel or Daniel Stern in this movie? <laughs> oh, shit. No, it's Howie Mandel. I'm yeah. sorry. It was funnier, too, because the mugging, it's not to an end in this movie. It's just him screaming into a void of comedy. <laughs> it's kind of why we need, like, those bigger moments of, like, injury to him to yeah. really punch it up, like He's Home Alone. alone in the woods. He gets attacked by a bear, but nothing really happens yeah. to him. His jacket's not even really must. He gets thrown down a waterfall at one point, and he's completely fine. The wasps get him. There's not a mark on him after yeah, that. He's attacked by wasps. <laughs> All these things happen to him that should pile up through the movie. And maybe he could get more over the top as he's kind of losing it because he's stuck in the yeah. woods with these kids he doesn't care about or whatever. And then he realizes he does care about him. There's an arc in here that they refuse to do. There's an <laughs> yeah. arc that's sort of there, but not fully emerging. In that he starts off as a completely selfish asshole, which I still found kind of funny. And then he gradually becomes like caring <laughs> leader but there's kind of like steps yeah. missing on that journey, clearly. Would you move your wrinkled asses? I'm in a hurry here. <laughs> ah, I'm gonna run you over. I do love the villains uh, seem to really flip-flop on the idea of killing children. And when you're done with him, make sure you kill the kids. Kids? <laughs> You gotta kill the kids. <laughs> and then later when they see the backpacks go over the cliff, they're like, ah, ha, ha, children are dying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but later on, he's like, oh, I, I didn't get into this to kill a bunch of kids. And when the kid yeets himself off the balcony, the villain's like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I like that they're about to kill the kids, but they don't remember, oh yeah, we have that scout leader tied to a tree. Oh, well, we don't want to kill him. Yeah, <laughs> We don't want to kill anyone. We actually have the opportunity to. Yeah. I want to ask a question about that scout leader. The John Belito FBI guy chains him to a tree, and it can't be a regular pair of handcuffs because it's clearly way too long to wrap around a tree. So that's clearly a set of leg bracelets that he's wearing on his arms to facilitate <laughs> this joke. He spends like a lot of the second half of the movie climbing up a tree and then later in the film he jumps down onto the John Polito FBI guy right without the chain but the thing is that tree was like way way back in the forest and they were at the top of the mountain by the time he gets up so how the fuck did he get up there yeah. like why was he in the tree he, like, he got to the top of the tree and then he bounced on top of the other trees until yeah. he got to the he's mountain he's jumping on the trees like a platform game Hold bounced it. so much the chains just blew off him yeah too, he, he pulled <laughs> Zena and defied <laughs> physics. He was just like. <laughs> just completely vertical over the trees yeah. towards the mountain. He's like Tarzanning through the second half of the movie off screen, I guess, to somehow end up in the tree line up the top of the mountain. I feel like this guy got the most laughs out of us the first time we watched it. Maybe because he was so unfunny, we kept doing the bushwhacked after every yeah. scene with him. Say what you will about the Daniel Stern mugging scenes. Depending on your preference for Daniel Stern mugging, at least those are somewhat amusing. The scenes with the scout leader, no, those just bomb. <laughs> I'm the thin khaki line between morality and depravity. Tenderfoot. Because again, he's not bouncing off of someone that it would be funny to do this straight man scout leader thing with. When he has yeah. the one scene with Daniel Stern, there might have been something there. It doesn't really make sense that he <laughs> glued him to a steering wheel, <laughs> but you got the ultra mugging and you got the straight man. That could be something. But then you have straight man with another straight man. Yeah. And like, yeah, you okay. have him with like John Polito for a bit. It doesn't really go much of anywhere. It's just like he's slightly annoyed with them. That's it. I am an inconsiderate person. Did you paste that note to my window? That's right. Right, cupcake. So at one point, the mom finds a napkin with the cabin's address on it. Yeah, he wrote it down earlier. Yeah, yeah, he wrote it down earlier, and then he spit his gum onto it when she asked for him to spit his gum out. And that's how she finds it. So she goes on her own. Again, does not bring the SWAT team or anything. I think she does talk to them. She talks they to don't that other guy her. where he seems like he's definitely corrupt, the second yeah. FBI guy, but it's like, oh, whatever. She goes up the mountain, ends up getting captured, and then Daniel Stern and the kids are going to to get the package. I don't think they know the mom is there. No, they don't until they get up there. And yeah. they haven't killed her for no reason. <laughs> they, they have a, a very funny scene where they cross a cliff by having Daniel Stern become a bridge. It's so he funny they no put it on the back. Of holding himself. <laughs> Yeah, look at that. He has no grip. They would have knocked him down there. <laughs> That's nonsense. Bushwhack. This doesn't physically Actually, make Again, sense. though, it should be like these close-ups, I guess, if you want him mugging and stuff, like struggling to hold them up. It's just kind yeah. of very flat as they crawl across him and then leave him there. He's like, hey, kids, you forgot me. Next scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, very funny. 
tenderfoot. Like, what? why is it like, ah, oh, you kids? Oh. <laughs> He's like about to fall. Why wasn't there a bigger punchline to it? It's like the problem with so many jokes in this movie. Yeah, I don't know if this is a director problem or a post-production problem or both. I feel like they just didn't have the bones, the structure to fix this in post. No. Because like in Rookie of the Year, which Daniel Stern directed, his character, he's so over the top, I don't know what the fuck he's doing. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have done that. But he's not the main focus of the movie. The rest of it has a tone that makes sense. It has payoffs like a comedy that is funny. <laughs> but you can't really do much if you don't have like the structure for it. So I don't know. Maybe it was the script, how it was rewritten, but something just didn't come together here. I don't think they ever quite found what their tone was supposed to be because it really is all over the place throughout the entire movie. You can't have a movie where someone frames their own death and extracts their own teeth in a movie where it's like yeah. cutesy scout antics. <laughs> it's very, it's very <laughs> weird. Isn't it funny that the kids found a playboy and they don't know what sex is. So they just, they discuss it. And then that leads to the birds and the bees. The funniest scene. <laughs> 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 Silence! I must mention my favorite stunt in the movie when that kid goes over the fucking railing. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Out of nowhere, we get this scene where the kid, he runs up and he hits this step that has miraculously appeared in this balcony <laughs> and somehow flings and then an himself. Adult stunt double fling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he yeets himself completely <laughs> off that cliff. He must have gone about a good 30 yards. He went like a javelin. Yeah. The bad guys are trying to shoot shoot the scout leader and Daniel Stern. No, they're trying to just kill the mom and Daniel Stern. Yeah, the mom scout leader. The scout, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know what you would call her. So I don't know. She did until she hired someone else to do it. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. She's going to get blown away. And so he goes, no. And they have to stretch for a reason why. The gun is knocked out of the bad guy's hands and none of the adults grab this kid before he flings himself <laughs> off of this cliff. That kid should have been messed up. Yeah. He like had to have landed on a rock and bounced off of it and then rolled onto this branch that's somehow growing out of granite or something. <laughs> They think that he is dead. Does the mom react that much? No, but Daniel Stern is like, that's one of my kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Punches the teeth out of the guy's face. Brilliant. <laughs> I mean, arguably that is the funniest moment in the entire movie and I don't think it was meant to be. <laughs> I feel like that scene sort of worked because Daniel Stern was acting like a human being for a second. Yeah. So it was kind of like, all right, I guess I could watch Daniel Stern beat the crap out of some snooty rich guy. He has he a didn't plan really, that makes no sense. He didn't really kill that kid. That kid did it to himself, yeah. to be honest. He yeeted himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hardly blame him. <laughs> that had nothing like, to do with the villain. That was just insane. <laughs> I did want to bring up that this kid, his other biggest role was Big Bully oh, yeah. as Rick Moranis' son. <laughs> Just before Dude, he's this. in the best. He did Big Bully and he's like, I can do better. And he did Bushwhacked. <laughs> Brilliant. He was also in Lost. I do want to point that out. He was hmm? in Lost for 11 episodes. <laughs> he was in Lost, apparently. I don't remember that. You know, it's the same character from Bushwhacked. He just keeps getting in these really elaborate adventures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like, they just have a flashback to Bushwhacked. He's like, you guys think you oh. have it tough on this island. I was stuck in the mountains with Dan. Daniel Stern mugging for a few days. Come you know, back to me when you've had There was actually tough. bugs in these woods, unlike the <laughs> island on Lost. <laughs> ah! Ah! They're eating me alive! Tenderfoot. We ought to talk about the absolutely nonsensical final scene as well. At the end of the movie, all the scouts, they're no longer tenderfoots because they've all got their badges and everything. <laughs> so they're at the at the ceremony. And Daniel Stern is also there. I don't understand how he's there to begin with because he was an escaped fugitive. And I guess this works on like movie top trumps rules when it comes to criminality in that if you are accused yeah, yeah. of murder, <laughs> that absolves you of all the other crimes like Grand Theft Auto or kidnapping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Running around with a firearm. We still don't know what he did to the shopkeeper, too. <laughs> I'm telling you, this was a reshoot. It just feels like this was something they tacked on, either because they yeah. didn't like the original <laughs> the ending. The original ending like, was him in jail. <laughs> <laughs> this ended with, like, he's just like, looks like I saved the kids. I think I'll be a scout leader. And then they're like, no, oh. you're going to jail. That would be the greatest ending to this film. <laughs> but they instead go with some yeah, bullshit. Yeah. You meant, like, it just ended with the bars closing. Oh! <laughs> It does end with 
him screaming in agony. It though. does. So, <laughs> like if he's just in jail doing that, <laughs> screaming and mucking through the bars. The actual scout leader says something like, "When you took these kids on overnight, you broke every rule in the book, and that includes abducting <laughs> children, apparently." <laughs> every rule in the Boy Scout book and the court of law. Yeah, <laughs> like this isn't just Boy Scout rules. You broke the law, sir. <laughs> But anyway, you decide, you know what? Taking these kids on this trip where you not only managed to nearly kill yourself several times, but kill the kids several times, <laughs> this means that you are fit to handle apparently about a hundred scout children by yourself. What? Yeah, he says the in he's going to take all of the Boy Scouts or the Ranger Scouts or America Scouts, depending on if you're looking at the flag or not. He's going to take all of them to Yosemite. And like, let's pretend none of this fucking bullshit in this movie happened. Let's just say that that he's just an honorary Boy Scout guide or whatever. Pretend even he, he did this competently. Even if he did, <laughs> pretend that this was a different movie, right? <laughs> he was not trained as a Boy Scout. He has no survival skills. He only survived because of these kids. So what the fuck's gonna happen when he takes him to Yosemite? Well, that'd be a lot for a good scout leader to take all those stupid yeah. kids. You have hundreds of kids that you're supposed <laughs> to be taking care of. You wouldn't have one good scout leader. You would have several scout leaders doing something like that. But maybe not the ranger scouts maybe that's not why they're not around anymore yeah it was the worst <laughs> the ranger scouts operates like royal rumble basis you just get more and more scouts <laughs> coming out through the entrance way <laughs> daniel stern is the winner of the royal rumble he just clung to the side of the ring <laughs> <laughs> that's my strategy that's what he's doing at the end of the movie he's like at the back coat like ah! <laughs> yeah the ending is he's like Fah! <laughs> Good thing I kept some of that stolen money. <laughs> hey, mister, I gotta make a dookie. What's that smell? Dookie. <laughs> dookie whacked. I think the bushwhacked fever is subsiding. Let's start with you, Phelan. Would you recommend bushwhacked to anyone? Maybe if you're ready to chug like a whole thing of bug spray before you watch. <laughs> <laughs> it might be enjoyable. <laughs> it's really hard with this because, like, you're gonna be annoyed at these comedy buildups that go nowhere. You're like, what? Oh, and then if you pay attention to the plot, you're like, um, <laughs> I have a few questions about any of that. You can get some enjoyment out of it, no, for being inept. <laughs> so, in that way, if you want to see Daniel Stern mug in the woods, this movie's for you. I think this movie is notable for being uh, kind of unnotable because it's not even like. <laughs> Infamous. It's just a bad movie everyone wants to forget. If you were a friend of Matthew Buck's, I would recommend it. <laughs> Matt, would you recommend this movie to anyone? I am not an objective opinion on this movie in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> My love for this movie is up there with something like Small Soldiers. In technically, it's not a very good movie, and there are loads and loads of holes in it. But if you love Home Alone, for example, and just wanted an oops, all Marvel version of it. This is the closest <laughs> thing that you'll get to that. So I, and you know, I, I have a lot of fond memories of this movie. It's the stupidest film, but I kind of adore it for what it is. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's my precious. <laughs> Someone make a gif of that, please. Yeah. <laughs> If you are a fan of sort of terrible 90s family films, but are kind of cozy in their own way, yeah, give Bushwhack to go. If you can find it anywhere, because it used to be on Disney Plus and it's not anywhere now. The world is trying to suppress that Bushwhack fever. <laughs> <laughs> they tried to wipe it out again. <laughs> there you have it. Bushwhacked, an underrated classic <laughs> on Turner Classic Movie. <laughs> <laughs> and now to exit out the episode, a celebration. Celebratory.
I'm not actually sure if this showed up on camera or not. So, uh, I'm marvin it up. Yeah! Bushwhack.